Um, tonight our speaker, Dr. Bruce McFadden, uh, he's going to be speaking on uh, fossils in schools tonight. I don't know that's the exact name, but in fossils in schools, kind of fossils in Florida schools. I do want to introduce him though, for those of you who may not know him, and I know he's, as folks my age and maybe older don't want to hear, but my, my guess, you, you've been involved in Florida fossils for pushing 50 years now. Uh, that, that, that's a, a, a heck of a dedication. He's a distinguished, distinguished professor at the Museum of Natural History um, in Gainesville. He studied at Cornell and Columbia. He has his degree in uh, geology, specializations in uh, paleontology. And as I said, he's been a mainstay in Florida paleontology for almost 50 years now. I had to see how he looked at me whenever I said that, because some people were like, <laughs> um, he's, been, he's been involved with almost every initiative in, in promoting Florida paleontology uh, over the, that 50 years from field work, uh, all, all the way from the field work, digging the stuff out to the financing side. I've seen him work on both sides of that. Uh, many of the programs, exhibits, discoveries uh, in, in Florida all have his name attached to them some way. Uh, years ago, whenever um, a lot of papers come up and his name's on a lot of papers because he's if, if he, even if he didn't find it, or even if he didn't describe it, or if he didn't write the new science on it, he's involved in getting the machinery to check it, the financing to go through it. He, he, he's some way involved in a lot of projects, even when he's not the guy that dug it out of the ground, he's able to help in the background, the other scientists uh, promote these papers and, and, and research. And uh, 50 years of very good work. He's the author of over 200 peer reviewed uh, scientific articles. And I saw some people walk around with this classic 1992 book, the Equus, is that the name of it? Uh, I didn't know you were bringing those, or I would have asked you to bring more. You did? Oh. Uh, it's hard to get book. And uh, online it says he, he's secured more than $40 million in funding for Florida, well, I don't know about Florida, but for projects over that 50 year period. That's a lot of money uh, pushed into, the, uh, into science and, and paleontology. And last, he, and I'm sure I didn't catch everything, last he's a visiting scientist at the Santa Cruz uh, County uh, Education Office, and he actually also worked for uh, the National Science Foundation as a program officer, and I think he had some other positions with them. So uh, he's done some great work over the years, especially in Florida, and we appreciate that. We're glad to have you here tonight. Dr. Bruce McFadden. Thank you. How do I turn these like I'll that? get those for you. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Microphone working? Good. Thanks, Mike. So I've actually been coming and talking to your club for almost, for, how, when was your club founded? Early 80s? 80s, 86. 86? Yeah, so I've been coming to your club and presenting for the past 35 years. I haven't been here in the past five or, five or so years, but I'm glad to be back. And uh, Barbara said, I, when Barbara asked me to present a talk this evening, I said, what do you want me to talk about? She goes, tell us what you've been doing lately. So that's what I'm talking about. And it's very different. It's actually not paleontology and, uh, and, and research. It's more about education and outreach, which is my passion right now, as I hope I will convey to you in, during my talk. All right, so I want to first talk about why I'm a paleontologist, my journey, like many of you. Um, you've had journeys in paleontology and your love for fossils, and I'm, I'm very much like you are. Then I want to talk about some work I did when I was on sabbatical as a visiting scientist in a school district in Santa Cruz, California, where I worked with a superintendent to get fossils into elementary schools. And then I became the director of an institute that's dedicated to understanding uh, the various types of earth systems, air, water, land, and life, and how fossils can be interpreted in those different systems. And in particular, I want to talk about a program that I've been working on for the past four years called the U University of Florida President's Moonshot, a scientist in every Florida school. So that's what I'm going to talk about this evening. All right, so my journey. Like many of you, um, I've loved dinosaurs since I was a kid. Okay, when I, in the early 50s, okay, uh, my mother would take me on the train. We, were, I, we lived in Mount Vernon, New York, and my mother would take me on the train, and uh, the thing that I wanted to do more than anything in New York is go see the dinosaurs at the American Museum of Natural History. That, to me, was a great day out. Okay, so my love of paleontology, I uh, started as a kid, I guess I never grew up. Okay, I still love what I do, and I have, um, uh, uh, I'm fascinated about dinosaurs and paleontology, 
Um, not so much dinosaurs now, now more fossil mammals and, and other things that have lived in Florida over the past 50 million years. But another thing that was inspirational in my life, my journey is my 10th grade earth science teacher. This is Mr. Greenstein at Portchester Senior High School in Portchester, New York, where I graduated in 1967. And he had us write term papers, and I wrote a term paper on Archaeopteryx. And my mother would take me over to the Yonkers, New York Library. Our, our library wasn't, didn't have a science section, so she'd drop me off at the Yonkers Library, and I'd be in the stacks, and I'd peer through all the books, and I'd read books by George Gaylord Simpson and others, and, and that's where I really um, developed a love for doing research. So thanks to Mr. Greenstein, who uh, gave me very high marks on my term paper for Archaeopteryx and told me that he didn't understand some of the words in there. <laughs> uh, I, I guess he gave me the confidence uh, to know that I could be a paleontologist if I want to, whereas before that it was a childlike curiosity that I didn't really know um, that I could be a paleontologist and, and you know, uh, as a profession. So anyway, so I wrote a book, which I'll talk about in just a second, that was published in 2019, about science and society, which is my big thing that I'm really interested in now. And I figured, I wonder if Mr. Greenstein is still with us, okay? Do the math, he might be. So I called, I, no, I emailed the, the principal of Porchester High School and said, uh, I'm writing a book and I want to dedicate one of the chapters in my book on K-12 outreach to my teacher then, Mr. Greenstein. Can you tell me what happened to him? And so they looked through the, per, the human resource, the personnel records, and they said, he left the next year and went to get his PhD at Syracuse, and then he became a superintendent of schools. So he, he, he moved up from being a, a science teacher, earth science teacher, to becoming a school superintendent, and lo and behold, he retired to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so, I got his, he, he, his address was in Green Acres, which is a, sort of a suburb of West Palm Beach, okay? So I wrote him a letter, and His widow, Aww. yeah, his widow wrote back to me and said, you missed him by about five years. Aww. Yeah. So I said, well, can I come and, can I come and, and, and present you with my book for, and the chapter on, on uh, K-12 outreach is dedicated to Mr. Greenstein, who got me interested in science. And it was actually very emotional, but this is Avery Greenstein. And here I am three years ago presenting my my brand new <laughs> book, Broader Impacts of Science on Society, to the widow of, of, of Mr. Greenstein, who, who, who gave me the confidence to be a scientist. So I, I suspect that for those of you who um, are scientists, that, or many of us, you've been inspired by a teacher, one way or the other, in, in your life. So uh, this is my story, a personal story about, a, 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 about how Mr. Greenstein a, a science teacher inspired me to, to pursue a, prof a profession in paleontology. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, until, so 40 years later, whatever it is, um, I didn't really do much work with teachers. I was mostly involved in my research on fossil horses and various other things. But then I had a project in Panama where we were collecting fossils along the Panama Canal when they were making new excavations for the canal. And a colleague of mine who worked in this, at the Smithsonian in Panama said, there's a superintendent of schools who'd like to bring teachers down on your Bruce's paleontological digs down in Panama. Could you, could you um, get with him? So that's Gary Bloom. And Gary Bloom is the guy in the hard hat over in the right. And he was the superintendent of schools for Santa Cruz City Schools. He's now retired. And um, so I, I hooked up with him. And in the first year, we brought eight of his teachers down to Panama with us. And it was really an inspirational experience to see the excitement of the teachers getting out in the field. This is, this is a high school biology teacher, SoCal High School, uh, Gail Alimo, a couple of my student interns, and then Gary. And here we are digging up 23 million year old fossils from right along the Panama Canal. This actually is where we find some, found some fossil rhinoceroses that used to live in Panama during the early Miocene. Okay, so that's a decade ago. <coughs> And that really launched my interest in giving back to society through working with teachers. Okay, and that's been my passion since that time. And we, we, we went to Panama to understand, I mean, Panama is literally the gateway between the Great American Interchange, the animals that evolved in South America and went northward, 
and the animals that evolved in North America and went southward, they all passed through the, the Isthmus of Panama, the Panama Gateway. So we were studying the kinds of animals preserved as fossils in, the, in what's now the Panama Canal. And I actually spent five years with teachers bringing them down to Panama with us. We had a total of, I think, almost 50 teachers that went with us over the five years. And these are mostly from California schools because that's because of Gary Bloom, but since that time I also brought teachers from New Mexico, from Navajo, from Navajo country, and then teachers, it makes very, very it makes a lot of sense that I also started to bring teachers with us from Florida. Okay, so here we are collecting, we, we have to go to an island, which I heard from the locals had lots of large triangular objects. They thought they were arrowheads, okay, okay, arrowheads. But anyway, so we rented, we rented a, a motorized dugout, uh, and all those people there are teachers from the, the third cohort. These are teachers mostly from California, and here we are going to an island, and in about two hours after we got off on the island, uh, the teachers collected about two dozen of these wow. megs. Okay, and the thrill on the, they had never collected fossils. Most of them had never collected fossils before. The thrill of seeing the teachers discover the, the megs was so exciting, I can't tell you. And of course, then, then we were finding some invertebrates as well, but this was a Miocene, about a 10 million year old sedimentary sequence from this island in, um, in one of the reservoirs that feeds the water into the Panama Canal. At night, we come back, it was really awfully hot and humid, very tropical, but, but you know, it was also exhilarating because you know, you're out there, you all know this, the thrill of collecting, and I saw that in every one of the teachers, okay? And then at night we'd go back and we'd have what were called pool si whoops, yeah, poolside chats, where the teachers would come back and we'd talk about what we found during the day, and then they'd talk about how they would develop lesson plans that they'd bring back into the classroom. When This was in July when they would come back in August and develop their lesson plans for the next year. They would incorporate their work with paleontology and, we'd, and they'd say, you know, paleontology is not, are not in the standards, but you can talk about evolution or diversity or ecology and, you know, whatever. So we help them sort of um, tailor their lesson plans in their curriculum to, based on their, their experiences. So this, this teacher just recently retired from Fort Myers Middle School. Um, Gail was from, uh, from Aptos, uh, California. Jason was an assistant principal in Monterey, biology teacher in California, middle school teacher at a um, at Cesar Chavez Middle School, okay, mm -hmm. working with kids that that um, from Title One schools, and then Rob is a science is a STEM coordinator from Pajaro Valley in the Watsonville, California area. I um, I can't tell you how rewarding it was, and also the friendships that I made with these teachers. Um, as a result of our, our shared experience. And it was more of a matter, it was more of a sense of collaboration as opposed to the scientists conveying the information to teachers. It was a collaboration. I got as much out of it mm -hmm. as they did in terms of uh, making me feel that I was doing what I felt I wanted to do with my career at this point in time. I published all the papers I need to publish. I've written my books and now I wanna do something that is meaningful to society. Okay, so the other thing is, so then I, then I, then, <clears throat> then I took an, a non-traditional sabbatical. So three years to Panama with the teachers and the provost of our university called for sabbaticals that were non-traditional. They wanted you to do something different than what a typical scientist does. A typical scientist writes a, writes a grant or gets a sabbatical to go to somebody else's laboratory and, you know, um, do, mix up chemicals or prepare fossils or something. So that's not what the provost wanted. He, saw, he wanted something that was way out. So I proposed that I was gonna be a scientist embedded in a school district in Santa Cruz, California, and help the superintendent schools to do something and make a difference, and I got the money. So I went off and I, I for an entire year, I was not a professor, I went and, and I became a, a visiting scientist in residence at the Santa Cruz County Office of Education for a year and basically, I could write my own ticket. The superintendent said, I'm not paying you, you do whatever you want. I said, what do you want me to do? He says, we have a terrible time because elementary school teachers are not trained to do science, but they're required to teach science with the new, the new kinds of standards. Do what you can 
to help the, the, science, the, the teachers build confidence. And, and I, he said, I said, could I use fossils? He says, do whatever you want, but just help us in that. So, so that was my passion for the year. I helped I worked with 20 different teachers in 20 different schools in the Santa Cruz County. And I was like a visiting scientist. I would go around to the schools and we developed a really cool lesson plan. The kids really loved it. I really loved it. Basically, we found local, mostly local fossils and I had the kids work in groups to identify the fossils. And the collective knowledge of four or five, three to third, fifth graders is really quite astounding. This is the study set that they would be given, okay? And you know, it wasn't, they didn't have, it wasn't the scientific name. It was like shark's tooth, <laughs> clam, leaf, sea urchin, sand dollar, excuse me, sand dollar, shark's tooth, you know, snail, tree rings, okay? Wood, um, tiny fossil snail, and this is the one that most people didn't get, most of the kids didn't get. But you know what it is, right? Yep. Horse tooth. <laughs> okay, I've this, so this was the highlight of my entire time as a visiting scientist in California. So most of the students collectively, regardless of what school they were in or regardless of their background, they all knew what Meg was. And they all knew, excuse me, they all knew these characters and they all wanted to know, hey, uh, Dr. Bruce, what is your favorite uh, character here? And I said, well, what's yours? I love Sid the Sloth, so I got to know the names of the different animals here. That, that engaged, when I, and I would put this up in my PowerPoint with the kids, and that got them turned on, because I was moving my frame of reference from a paleontologist to what they knew about movies, okay? And that's how you start to engage the kids. So, most of the kids working collectively with very little knowledge about paleontology could identify at that level Two thirds or three quarters of the of the of the of the, uh, and we had a a sheet where they would fill it out and they would negotiate with one another. I don't really think that's this. It's, I think it's that. And most of them got this one wrong, and most of them thought it was a piece of wood. And I'll never forget this one time where it's a group. There were four guys. There were four boys, and there were this sort of shy girl. And the boys are negotiating that they think it's a piece of wood, and the girl goes, "No, it's not a piece of wood." And they sort of they sort of tried to tell her that she didn't know what she was talking about. And, she, and they, they said, well, what do you think it is? And she said, I think it's a, a horse tooth. Wow. And I'm listening, I'm saying, whoa, this is really cool. So we so at the end, what I do, so anyway, so they put down, the guys won out, right? And they put down fossil wood. So I go around the room at the end, and I ask each each of the each of the groups to tell me what they thought each thing was. And then I said, well, table number five, what did you think number nine is? And um, and the guys say, oh, it's a, it's a piece of it's a piece of fossil wood. And I can see the girl. She, and I said, so I don't remember what her name was, but I said, so what do you think? Just well, she says, my grandpa had a horse in the barn, and the horse died, and and the horse then the skull was dried out and was on the the top of the fence in the barn, or the top of the rail in the in the barn, and the teeth fell out. And that, that looks like a fossilized horse too. And all the boys are looking at me and I say, she's right. <laughs> so that was the highlight of my, of my time in, in Santa Cruz, California with the kids. All right, I also taught teachers because in, in, in addition to teaching the students about paleontology, um, Rob Hoffman, the STEM supervisor said, um, do, some, do some professional development. And so one of the big standards that the teachers were wrestling with at the time was the, the sense of how you do the science that we do and what the concept of phenomena is. So I did a, a professional development for 70 teachers from the Pajaro Valley School District in Southern Santa Cruz County who teach at very uh, impoverished Title I schools where most of the kids are children of migrant farm workers, okay? Um, so I felt like I was making a difference here with the teachers who would then instill the knowledge of what they learned uh, it, to the students in the classroom. Very rewarding. Okay, so that, that was my, my year in Santa Cruz, California. I get back and then two years later, we get this gift by the Thompsons who were alums from the University of Florida who wanted to found an institute, to create an institute to better understand and con communicate about the importance of the earth and its natural systems. And that's the science, that's the science or the study of Earth systems, okay? 
And they felt that the research that was being carried out by the, by the scientists at the University of Florida was top notch, but we could do a better job to communicate that research for the benefit of society. And that's the institute I was asked to be director of four years ago. And that's, I'll talk about that a little bit more now. So what are earth systems? It's the concept in geology or earth and environmental sciences that the main systems of the earth are all interrelated. The atmosphere is related to the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere is related to the geosphere, the land. And life is related to the biosphere. It's all interrelated, okay? As one thing changes or is perturbed, that has cascading effects on the other systems of the earth. And we, need, we as scientists need to do a better job to communicate that knowledge and concept of process for the benefit of, of, the, of, of um, the audiences that we reach out to. The other thing that's big in earth systems is um, over the past several tens of thousands of years, there's been another, another um, thing that has perturbed the natural systems after we've come out of the last late glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, and that is the in increasing influence and impact of humans on the Earth's natural systems. So human impacts are part of what we teach about. Uh, and I, like, I don't need to convince you here in Tampa, but um, why should a kid in Miami give a darn about the fact that the polar ice caps are melting, okay? Okay, and, and that to me, indicates it's it's the connection okay why did do, why does a kid living in miami have to worry about what's going on in in, in the polar ice caps for obvious reasons that i don't need to tell this audience okay all right so the audiences that my institute serve are the scientists who are the the producers of knowledge the students at the universities the university that we teach about the science Lifelong learners like yourselves, okay? Policy makers, legislators, and the reason I have this in bold is because the, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about a project related to the next generation of Floridians, and that is the kids in schools through a project called the Moonshot. Again, in 2018, my institute was three months old, and the president of our university challenged the faculty of the university to develop um, broad initiatives that were um, seemingly unattainable over the short term, but might ultimately or incrementally build impact and benefit back to the future of uh, Florida and its citizens. So um, that was called the, the President's Moonshots, which takes its name from President Kennedy, who in, in I was in middle school. So anyway, whenever that was, that was a long time ago. But in the 60s, thank you. In the early 60s, President Kennedy had some famous speeches at Rice, Rice University and to the, to the US Congress challenging the science and technology um, infrastructure of our country to put a person on the moon by the end of the decade. In 1963, that was unimaginable. We didn't have the infrastructure. And in 1969, it happened. So that's since been, any large, seemingly unattainable project that has major benefit or is a huge challenge is now called a moonshot. Okay, so there were, nine, there were 17 moonshot proposals that were submitted to the university. Um, and one of them was a scientist in every Florida school, which was mine, and we got it funded. So it's a four-year pilot project, and we envisioned a decade from 2018 that UF scientists from our program would visit every K-12 public <coughs> school in every Florida district at least once a year. That's a huge lift. How many public schools are there in Florida? Anybody oh, know? Uh, Anybody know? Or 67 in Polk County. 67, no, well, yeah. there's 67 that's counties. There are about 4,000 public schools in Florida. Okay, so our challenge was to start off and build a pilot project that could demonstrate that we could, if we were to scale it up, get a scientist in every school. And that, and that, that was funded by the, the provost for four years. And since we've gotten other grants and, and foundation funds, and we're talking to legislators about the future to try to sustain and, and, and scale up this project. All right, so our first, the first thing, one thing we do is professional development in the summers. And the first one we did was back to school for, te for science teachers. And we were the theme of that particular week-long professional development 
in at the University of Florida, the teachers went back to the dormitories and were, were students again for, for five days and worked in laboratories at different, uh, of different science laboratories at the University of Florida. And at the end of our, on Friday, they all made reports about what they learned and the kinds of lesson plans that would be outcomes of their experience there. So here we are, here we are with teachers doing different kinds of you know, chemical stuff up at the top. This all relates to the biosphere. Um, drilling, drilling sediment cores uh, in the plant in, the, in one of the botany laboratories, and this was my graduate students who had teachers sorting fossil matrix from from the Montbrook fossil site. More about that in just a second. Got to get some fossils in there, no matter what. Okay. All right. Okay. And this with our group, we had about three dozen teachers and scientists, and they they were from. Uh, they were from from my all the way from Miami to Lee County up to this area and all the way to Escambia County our goal strategically is to get is to impact different counties county sort of strategic districts around the state so I could build political support for to sustain this ultimately okay the other thing I've, 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 I've become passionate about um, is I really would like to help with, the, with teacher retention, STEM teacher retention in the workforce, because every teacher who leaves the workforce and in some schools, the attrition is as much as a, a third of the teachers leave every year. Yeah. So within three years, essentially much of the workforce in some of the schools, particularly in Title I schools from underserved communities, the teacher, there's almost 100% replacement in uh -huh. teacher workforce. And if I could help to mentor or to sustain teachers in the workforce, I'd like to make that part of the part of the project as we would scale up. Um, and that was this was validated to me. The other thing is I want to give additional mentoring for early career teachers because the, the greatest attrition in, in the public school STEM teacher workforce, not just in Florida but nationally, is in the first three to five years. Three to five years or 20 years out where teachers are just being, basically saying, I'm tired of this, I'm out of here. Okay? So when they go to Panama with me, it rejuvenated them. What we found in their qualitative feedback to us, and they said they go, they went back, they were energized and went back in the classroom, and it sustained their interest in what they were in their profession. Okay. All right. So then we would also go on the road show. If they didn't come to us at, at, in Gainesville, uh, we would go to them. So here we are with 3D printed human skulls. Uh, Molly, Molly was a PhD student in anthropology who is studying. Um, the construction of the facial region in humans and other other mammals and she loved working in, in, in school so much that she, she she left her PhD a year and a half ago to be an anatomy and physiology teacher up in, up in, in an underserved school out in suburban Atlanta and she's defending her doctoral dissertation next Monday okay so and then um, I have two I have two uh, coordinators that have hired on the project both former teachers, one from Palm Beach County, one from inner city Dallas, Texas. And these are two undergraduate student interns who really like working in the schools. Okay. All right, so we've gotten lots of news, uh, notoriety through the, the, uh, with the mass media. And here's a really good one about how Molly made a difference in, an, in a school, in a Title I elementary school in Pensacola in Escambia County. Okay, the next slide it should automatically start if all this technology works. Students in Escambia County getting a new perspective on science today. A scientist visiting classrooms at Lincoln Park Elementary. That's part of a program called Scientist at Every Florida School. The initiative will end by the University of Florida's Thompson Earth Systems Institute. The goal is to connect scientists with every K-12 school in five counties, including Escambia County. So far, we've been visiting with the elementary school students and it's been really productive. Um, especially with the questions, they had a lot coming in. And so what we're doing is basically showing our educational journey and how they can become researchers. Uh, leaders of the program say because Escambia is a coastal community, they'll be able to teach students about things like sea level changes, saltwater intrusion, red tide, and algae blooms. All right, so if are there any teachers in the audience or anybody who has a spell okay so if you're interested um, in this program it's really simple you just go to our website you could type in scientists in every Florida school and you just click on this 
this button here and you, it, a, Google, a very short Google form comes up. And basically, you, for example, you say, I'm a third grade teacher from such and such um, elementary school in Pasco County or wherever. And my kids want to, I, I have to teach them about the Earth's magnetic field and I don't have a clue about this. Could you help me? Could you also send a role model who looks like the kids in my class? Okay? It just so happened that I don't look like the kids in, their cl in her class, but I did my doctoral dissertation on the Earth's magnetic field. So I went to talk to those, I did this virtually. But anyway, so it's a matchmaking service. The teacher has a need, the scientist have, have, has the, the, the content expertise, and we put them together. Okay, so in addition to professional development, the training, we also do classroom visits to help support the teachers with their science content need. Then we, then they all wanted to go and collect fossils. Okay, does that come as any surprise to you? Here are the Escambia teachers wanting to collect fossils, and this is back before, about four months before COVID hit. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the cool thing is that the person, anybody digging at Montfort can make can make scientific discoveries. Rochelle, who, teach, who taught at Lincoln Park, same school as was in that that news clip. Different teacher though. Okay, she found a um, a tiny horse tooth from from Montbrook, and we it's from Nanipis, and we have precious few of these. It's, it's very rare from Montbrook, so she made a rare discovery, and the, the enthusiasm or just the sense of self-worth for her that she could make a scientific discovery that, that is worth a darn was really very powerful. And she became a rock star with, with her science supervisor, <laughs> Carolyn, who's by the way, very supportive of what we're doing. She's a STEM coordinator for, the, for Escambia County and she just thought it was fabulous that, 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 that um, one of her teachers in uh, in, in elementary school could find a uh, fossil, uh, uh, fossil horse tooth. That was really cool. Okay, so then everything broke down just about this time two years ago. Yeah. Boom! Okay, our in-person professional developments up at the top, couldn't do those anymore. Our classroom visits, this is my student Sean, working with, student, with kids in an <laughs> elementary school in Alachua County, where the University of Florida is. None of that was possible anymore. We had to quickly pivot, and early in the spring, now what happened was, is right after everything hit, the teachers were so consumed with having to change their, their kind of instruction that really the spring of 2020 was a dead time for us because they were, they were, they were just scrambling to, to um, change their, 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 um, their learning style, their teaching styles, excuse me. But once things got, got well underway for this fall semester, everything changed to virtual for us. So we had our, our PD, our per professional development in the summer, July of 2020, we quickly pivoted. In March of 2020, we had sent out applications for an in-person, week-long professional development at the University of Florida on the nature of science, the process of science, how it's done. Because teachers tell us that they learn the content of science, but they don't really know how scientists do what they do and that's called the nature of science, and they're supposed to teach this, but they don't know how to do it. So our PD, our professional development in, in the summer of 2020 was not on one of the spheres, it was on the nature of science, and that's what we did. And the night, sort of the, the silver lining of COVID was, we were limited to 32 places of teachers um, in person the year before, because we had to pay for them, okay? And it was about, a, with all the expenses, it was over $1,000 a teacher. Oh. But when you have virtual, we had 55 teachers and the scientists, so, and that, cost, that was zero cost. So in a sense, you can scale up. It's not the same. Doing a virtual walkthrough for three days in a, in a laboratory at the University of Florida is very different from getting in there and mixing up the chemicals or, or coring the sediments or whatever. It's a different experience, okay? But we learned that we could be resilient. Regardless of what COVID would throw at us then or now, we're gonna do what we need to do. And likewise, we pivoted so that every one of our virtual, every one of our classroom presentations after March were in person, okay? So last year, a year later, 2021, we had 2,000 school visits. There are four of us working on this project. Okay? We had 2,000 visits. What we do is 
we have a thousand teachers in our network at 500 schools and we have 750 scientists in our database and we do the matchmaking service, okay? And then sometimes some of us like myself can't help ourselves, we wanna go into schools. I'm going into the schools two weeks from now to help them sort Mont Montbrook Matrix because I just like working with the, with the teachers and the students. But anyway, so a year ago, our stats were that we had 2,000 virtual visits in 42 counties in Florida, reaching 55,000 students in 500, 500 um, public schools, most of which are Title I, which, which, serve under, which provide instruction to underserved, kids from underserved backgrounds. That's our focus. Okay. Whoops. Okay, so last month we, uh, we decided the teachers were crazy for wanting to go to Montbrook last year. We couldn't do it. Everything was shut down. The university wouldn't let us, but this year things have opened up. So we had our first field trip since 2019 to collect fossils at Montbrook, and this was February. It was one of the really cold days in February, as you can see. Okay, we have 10 teachers, and this was the this was the beginning experience for them when they were going to they then were going we're going to learn the, the stratigraph the context the geologic context of Montbrook and what it's like to collect fossils in the field none of them had ever collected fossils before okay here we are um, Dr. McFadden here is pontificating about the importance of of of, of the Montbrook site okay and um, here we are, and the teachers, we all put, had name tags on. They're from <coughs> 10 teachers from eight different schools, from five or six different counties, and we had one repeat from the year before because the concept of a teacher leader who already knows what, what could mentor the other students, so, excuse me, the other teachers. So we had one repeat. Susan, she arrived late. But anyway, these are the, the new teachers from this cohort. Um, digging fossils at the Montbrook site, which is a Miocene locality in Levy County, okay? And here they are, and each of them are, for those who've not been there, or you, I, I guess Richard's talked about Montbrook before, so you are generally familiar, but basically each, each teacher, each digger, gets um, a meter square frame, and they, they dig up with, with dental picks and brushes, okay? You know the drill, but they didn't. So they spent the day there learning how to dig up fossils, and uh, Susan, so okay, turtles. Now, I gotta tell you that we have billions of turtles from Montbrook, okay? And, and I don't get too worked up about turtles. Some people do, I don't. Uh, but a teacher, this is Susan Hahn, who was our teacher leader from this year, hadn't been to Montbrook the year before because they were shut down. We just sent the matrix to their schools. But this, was, this for her was an inspirational experience because now she could see where the fossils, the matrix, the, the tiny fossils came from and she collected fossils on her own. So as far as she was concerned, this was super cool, this, this turtle shell. And then there's a turtle shell in the upper right there. But then one of the teachers was excavating and you see these things right here? What are they? It's like a gum tooth. Gum tooth, it's gum tooth. Okay, fossil, elephant-like animal. Proboscidean mm -hmm. from the Miocene, five to six million years. That's that's one of the, that's one of the molar teeth, and that was we were shouting, screaming. It was really cool. Okay. And then at the end of the day, they all went home with with uh, calipers, scale bars, and about a five pound bag of matrix from, sand from the set from the locality that we'd washed already. We'd already washed through, so it was the concentrated matrix that was highly fossiliferous. And what they're going to do now is they're going to build lesson plans around Florida State standards using these using these kinds of materials. And what it looked like last year, up at the top, is the kids were working mostly on their own. Some were working from home, others were, when they were allowed back in the schools, then they were picking the matrix just like we do. And Susie, I said, was, this is her second year, but this is the results of some of her students' labor in picking from last year, okay? They have, they have study guides, they have keys of the common fossils. Can't, you can't, the most commonly encountered fossils, but there are, fish spines here, and you can see shark's teeth, and what are these up here? Diamond-shaped 
what kind of what kind of fish is this? Gar, gar scales. Gar scales, shark's teeth, fish vertebrae, growth rings. Okay. Um, Repti reptile, that looks like a reptile jaw, a lizard jaw, etc., etc. Okay, so they're finding they're finding stuff they can they can identify. And what Susan told me was that they have a, an hour break after lunch, and they can do what they want. They can go to study hall. But what she did is in the media center, she set this up, and it was astounding how many kids right. wanted to go into the media center after lunch and and pick matrix on their own <laughs> on their own initiative. Okay. All right, so so that's where we are so far um, with the scientists in every Florida school program. We've gone through COVID. We've worked in 42 of the 67 districts. There are four of us, five of us, excuse me, with our PR and marketing person, two coordinators, myself, and then, a, then a, um, sort of an executive assistant of the Institute. But the thing is we've been able to leverage the teachers, the network of a thousand teachers in 500 schools, and 700, and we have this database of 750 scientists. So it it's really is, a, um, we've leveraged their interest on a volunteer basis to do this work for us, okay? So now I wanna talk about another initiative at the University of Florida, recently has been to bas make, basically make the University of Florida a, a university that has artificial intelligence as one of the major themes of the university, whether it's in the humanities or the sciences or engineering or the health-related professions. So there's been this campus-wide um, initiative to try to to try to to try to get artificial intelligence in uh, into whatever you're doing as a scientist. And we did a pilot study with teachers from Flagler County back last May, where we used Megalodon, and we. We had the teachers um, look at the megalodon teeth, and then we taught them how a machine or an uh, a smart computer, it's called machine learning, but we, 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 we then taught them that how a machine would also identify a megalodon tooth through the concept of machine learning. And based on the evaluation, the survey results, we then submitted that for a proposal to the National Science Foundation. And we, we just recently found out uh, three weeks ago that we received a $1.3 million grant to leverage the scientists in every Florida school program to use fossil shark's teeth to teach, te to teach teachers and kids about machine learning, which is a field of artificial intelligence. And what the, what the reviewers of our proposal said was, one of the major strengths of what we had was this scientists in every Florida school infrastructure. We didn't have to create it, we already had it, okay? So we're very excited about this and this is my student, Victor, who just recently got his PhD, and he studied fossil sharks, but this is a three-year project, $1.3 million. We're gonna, we're gonna have 76 STEM teachers from any public middle school throughout Florida, including Hillsborough County, hint, hint, if any of you know anybody who might be interested. We're in the, we haven't yet started to recruit the teachers. We just got notification. The grant itself starts on, on April 1st. Coming up. Yeah. So, um, how's my time? Um, so, humans, what, how would you describe this to? Big. <laughs> big, well actually, big, the machine doesn't care about the size, it's scale independent, okay? So let's say that, so I'm gonna say that other than its size, that it's big, how would you describe this to? Just, triangular. Tri good, triangular shape, okay, what else? Horn. Okay, yes. Rounded on top to pivot. Round, rounded on top, okay, what else? Color to pivot. Color, hold it, color, who said color? Okay, what else? Texture. Thank you, that's it, that's all we need. Shape, color, texture, okay? So, the other thing is a background, but I'll talk to you about that, because what happens is, when we're gonna, we're gonna feed picture, photographs of megalodon teeth into a database, you're gonna help us if you want to, hint, hint, okay? Upload pictures of your Megalodon, and we're gonna use those to train the model, what's called, for machine learning, so that the computer can identify the Megalodon teeth. So what, what, what I, I, the aha moment that I had as a scientist, I don't know anything about machine learning, okay? I'm not that smart. But my friend in the College of Education is really smart. 
and he said that there's this program in Google called uh, Teachable Machine where we could feed in and train the model. We didn't have to write the computer program, it already exists. So we fed in 100 pictures of Megragon into Google Teachable Machine, and after that time, Google Teachable Machine could identify any photograph like this at a 99% uh, level. And what it also does, though, is it, do it knows that this is not part of, ooh, it's really fascinating, the computer model or algorithm takes out the background because that would confuse, might confuse us, but it, it doesn't to them. The other thing is that although the teachable machine, uh, so color is also a problem because you know, we know that the color of the megalodon is irrelevant, but in most, in, you have to teach the, the machine that the megalodon teeth are, are gonna be of different colors and then it knows that. If they're always dark gray or always tan, then it's gonna, that's gonna be part of the thing it's gonna be searching for in artificial intelligence. So what it's looking for, basically, it looks at the triangular perimeter, okay? The, the, the perimeter of the tooth, it's triangular shape. It doesn't care about the size, and it also cares about the texture. So you have a shiny, sort of a shinier uh, one color, which is the, the enamel part of the, the crown, and then you have another part with a, a rough texture, which is the root at the top. And that's what it uses, the machine uses, to discriminate this megalodon teeth. And then what we do is we can feed in other kinds of shark's teeth that are different shape, hemipristis, megaplion, whatever. And then what we would do is, is and so the teacher machine will then know what these different teeth are, and then you can put an unknown up and ask the teacher machine, what is this? And it scans through its models and it can tell you whether it's megalodon, hemipristis, megaprion, or none of them. And then you can keep building that model with more teeth. So we're gonna teach teachers and kids to understand how machines learn. And to me, before I did any of this, it was a black box. I had no clue how, the, how a machine did this, but how machine learning did this. But once we figured out what's, these are called, this is called feature analysis and feature analysis in engineering, machine learning engineering. And once I realized, you're using the same things that humans, what you all just, much of what you all just said are the essential features of this. That's what the machine, uh, we teach the machine to learn. Okay, but we're gonna develop curriculum. We're gonna use shark's teeth to, because kids are excited. It, you know, imagine trying to do machine learning on pencils or band-aids or some, what, what else would be super boring? Like, I don't know, peanuts, I don't know. But anyway, but if you say, hey, you're gonna learn about artificial intelligence with Megalodon, boom, they're interested right away. Okay, so that, that was, that's a hook to get them in. So we're using fossils to hook the kids in to learning about science. Okay. So how can you get involved if you want to? We have an online portal where you can upload images of your fossils called the My Fossil E Museum, and <clears throat> right here, and we're gonna be doing what's called a mega blitz, a megalodon blitz. We don't have enough <laughs> specimen photographs in our, in our collections to train the model. We need, to do a really good job, we need 500 images. We now have about 200. I'm so proud. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna send a general a general uh, request from to fossil clubs. We have actually a network of, in the fossil project of over 11,000 people who are part of this network, and we're gonna challenge them to help us reach 500 um, photographs that we can then teach the the machine to learn how to identify megalodon. So we'll we'll get you if you're interested. We'll get you involved if if you want to. But that's one, one of the first things we're gonna do is we're gonna have a, mega, a megalodon blitz. And all you have to do is take pictures of your fossils. Doesn't even, it, it'd be nice if it had a ruler because that's what we call for in the catalogs, but the machine doesn't really care about calibrating with the ruler. All right. So, I wanna wrap up what I've been talking about. So Barbara, here's what's, here's what's been going on with Bruce for the past, <laughs> You know, decade or so. Uh, I'm really passionate about teacher outreach, as I hope you can see from my talk. Fossils are really a great way to get kids involved in science learning. You all know that already. Uh, getting teachers out to the Montfort fossil site and having them dig alongside scientists and doing authentic research means a lot to them. 
a couple of teachers went back to the classroom and their kids said, so you're a scientist now. And it validated for them that that was that their, their worth in terms of their instructional um, credibility. Okay, and then I'm really excited about this new direction with this new grant using fossil charts select like Meg to teach about AI. And the last thing I wanna say is um, that I think jo Dr. Gluck maybe talked with you about, we, we're gonna have, we just closed down the dinosaur eggs and baby exhibit. I think I've talked with a couple of you about, you've been up to see that. That's closed down now, but we're opening up on April 2nd, another exhibit called Fantastic Fossils. Science up close. And it opens on Saturday, April 2nd. And this is good. Basically, we're going to be doing an exhibit where we're going to have people sorting matrix or preparing fossils or identifying fossils or scanning them for 3D images or maybe even doing machine learning. Okay, and we're going to be doing conducting our science and what we do, the practice of paleontology in an open laboratory where the public can come in and see what we're doing and ask us questions and interact with us. So uh, that's the next thing in store for us in the future in terms of the, the exhibit that's going to open and will be on display for uh, probably until the end of, of this, this next year. So that's, that's what I've been doing and uh, thank you all for your attention. AI uh, photographs, uh, is there an advantage to just two-dimension photographs or three-dimension? Two-dimension is fine. Two is no. It's actually easier, and the reason shark's teeth are really perfect for this is because they are two-dimensional. It gets really more complicated if it's three-dimensional because you, you have to rotate the image. If, 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 if in two-dimensional space you don't have enough characters to, to teach the machine, then it's more complicated. So shark's teeth are perfect for this because they're essentially two-dimensional. For most cases, essentially two-dimensional. Yes? Is there a place for retired school teachers? And are you doing anything with Polk County yet? We haven't, but we'd love to. We would love to um, involve, we've had some requests from retired teachers. Depending upon your expertise, we can likely match you with, with, um, with our database when we, get, when we get interest expressed from teachers who might might uh, need something that you could offer. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm taking her home. Are you home? <laughs> so every month, well not every month, every month that his mother allows them, uh, Lawrence and, Kat and Katora come up and do a, uh, a fossil skit for us. He has about a five minute one tonight. Coming up, guys. So for those of you who don't know the rules, do not shout out the answer if you know who the guest is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This time I decided to do something different. She's going to host it. <laughs> Welcome all to our prehistoric party. Tonight, your daunting task is to guess the identity of our special guest. Here's your first clue. He's dead. Here's your second clue. He's big in more ways than one. Welcome, sir. Do please come in. I'm trying, squeezing my neck in through the window. It's not easy fitting in doors when you're one of the biggest animals ever to walk on land. I'll say, not to be rude, but just how large are you, if you don't mind me asking? That's no problem. 85 feet total length, made up mostly of my neck and tail. In fact, I'm one of the longest dinosaurs known from a complete skeleton. Really now? Yup. Yes. Yeah. I was discovered on Independence Day in 1899 by men working for the steel tycoon Andrew Carnegie. Call me the Star Spangled Dinosaur, if you can believe it, and have me named after him. You must have been quite the phenomenon then. How oh, was I ever? I helped make dinosaur household words, and I became the first dinosaur that many people had ever seen in a museum. I was so popular that Carnegie had multiple cast copies of my skeleton to be used in museums all over the world. London, Palace, Berlin, you name it. 
But he kept the original bones, of course. Truly amazing. You're not only the large in size, you're also a huge celebrity. It is quite an honor. The pleasure is all mine, really. Oh, did you know that some college students even made up a poem about me and my fame? Oh, how does it go? Like this. <clears throat> Crowned heads of Europe all make a royal fuss over Uncle Andy and his old hold it! <laughs> Before you give yourself away, let our audience guess who you are. Let's go over the clues. He is one of the largest dinosaurs known from a complete skeleton. He has a very long neck and a very long tail. He was found by men working for him, was named after Andrew Carnegie. Cast copies of his skeleton can be seen in museums all around the world, and he became the first dinosaur that millions have ever seen and still remains famous to this very day. Who is he? Come on, you all can shout it out if you want. Apatosaurus? Apatosaurus. No. Brontosaurus. Diplodocus Carnegie. You got it. <laughs> Our Diplodocus Carnegie, the double beamed lizard. And it's a pleasure to meet all of you little people. Modest, famous, and modest. Don't see that every day. Thanks. But all this talking has made me hungry. Say, so, where's your nearest forest? Thank you all for coming to our not so little prehistoric party. Be sure to join us next time. We're really going for a toss call for selling right now. <laughs> long necks based on Dippy, but we call him Dempsey. <laughs> he has an art as big as his stomach. <laughs> He's a pretty friendly guy and uses that long tail of his to keep troublemaking carnosaurs in line. <laughs> now, like he said, the Flodicus Carnegie I've measured about 85 feet in length and it is one of the largest dinosaur skeletons known. However, another species of the Plodocus, some of you may know it by its other name, Seismosaurus, could probably grow to 110 feet long, making it one of the largest dinosaurs in the Morrison Formation. But to go even bigger, a cousin of the Plodocus called Supersaurus probably measured up to 130 feet long, placing it in the size range of some of the Titanosaurs found in South America. Just imagine it. Look off in the distance. Is it a mountain? Is it an earthquake? No, it's Super Soros! <laughs> Able to devour all forests in a single bite. <laughs> Able to crack the whip at any villainous carnivore. <laughs> See Super Soros coming soon to a theater near you. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you very much. Theater of the Mind.